Happy hour time on the Guy Benson Show. It's Tuesday, Election Day in six states. We'll bring results and analysis to you tomorrow based on what happens tonight. We've given our previews earlier in the program today. As we kick off our final hour, very pleased to welcome back to the show, first time in a while, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, Republican of Illinois. And it's been a while because he's been a a busy man. Congressman, welcome back. (laughs) Thanks. Good to be back. How are you? Well, I'm great. And since we last spoke, I do believe that congratulations are in order. I follow you on social media. And uh, you were married not that long ago. That is amazing. Where did that happen? Tell us all about it. Yeah, well, thanks. I uh, I married uh, – her name's Sophia. She's actually the press secretary for Homeland, and uh, we got married in Antigua, Guatemala, and it was it was amazing. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, very uh, – how do you say it? Inexpensive there, and we had a nice wedding, about 150 people, and that's the perfect number for anybody wedding planning. It's a perfect number because you get a chance to basically say hi to everybody and hang out with them. If it's too big, obviously, you know, you're sitting around racking your brain for who you didn't talk to. But uh, that was uh, about th- uh, just shy of about four weeks ago, and it's been awesome. You know, our wedding was in September, and we had almost exactly 150 people on the dot. That's and I perfect. very much agree with you. It was a perfect amount where you felt like there was a good critical mass where it wasn't small. Like when the dance floor was full, it was really full. Yeah. And there was a good number of people there, but it was still small enough to be personal and intimate and get to chat with everyone at some point and to basically know everyone for yeah. the most part. There weren't and, a lot of strangers. Yeah, and we you know, we, we made sure to spend the moment, you know, enjoying the ceremony. You know, I'm Protestant, so it was only like twenty minutes long and uh and then, you know, we went you know, afterwards, and we're able to just talk, and and then the next morning we all had brunch, and so it was really nice. Congrats to you too, although you're the uh, you're the old married man now. And, you know, <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, I'm an old pro. I've been at it for months. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> so did you guys do an immediate honeymoon, or are you waiting and doing it another time? So we did. The cool thing now to say is a mini moon. So we did that. We went uh, to Mexico for a few days after. We stayed in Guatemala a couple days. And uh, but we're going to do a bigger one later. So, you know, we're I, hopefully around Memorial Day. But, you know, with all this travel and situ- stuff going on, I, you know, I don't know right. if we're going to be able to get it done. Now, is it classified where you're thinking about going or should we talk offline about that? <laughs> we could talk offline. I actually need some ideas. So maybe. you can. Help. Oh, well, I'm I'm a font of ideas. So Perfect. the mini like moon, the, the box has been checked on that one. Our mutual friend, Mary Catherine Ham, just got married. She's yeah. doing her mini moon right now. Um, That's and awesome. so, I saw that too. yeah, no, it's, it's all just so many blessings and exciting times. Although, unfortunately, Congressman, we do have to turn to more serious uh, and weightier subjects as well. I want to begin with Afghanistan. We'll come back to coronavirus, but we've had on this program over the last few weeks, Stephen Hayes. We had General Jack Keane on the show last week. We're getting people's thoughts and overall takes on this potential peace deal or exit deal between the United States and the Taliban in Afghanistan. And it really seems like it's off to a very rocky start, but the administration insists that it's still a go. And I wonder, I know that you have very strong feelings on this, but you know, there's a very large uh, percentage, I would say, of the American people and a very strong strain in American public thought that Afghanistan has been an act of war for the United States now for almost two decades, and without a clear vision of what victory looks like, President Trump is right to perhaps even embrace an imperfect deal to get us out of there. That's one line of thought. The other line of thought is more along the lines of what we heard from Stephen Hayes and even General Keene, which is if you get out stupidly or prematurely, even though that seems like a strange word to use given the time horizon here, then the problems metastasize and come back and you end up in a worse position having to get engaged again down the line. Where do you come down? How should Americans think about this deal as things unfold? Well, I'm more in the latter camp, and I think Iraq is a prime example. You know, President Obama said we leave behind a stable, democratic Iraq. We left, and uh, and there wasn't an active combat going on in Iraq at that time, and we saw what happened. This is not too far-fetched to think the same thing is going to happen in Afghanistan. I'll first off preface this by saying 
I hope I am wrong, and I hope the president is right. I want to be very clear about that. Uh, every war does end in a negotiation. And I mean, even at the end of World War II, even though both countries knew they were defeated, they negotiated in theory and signed something. But in the situation we have now, I think what the mistake that's being made <coughs> by a lot of folks is thinking of this as an act of war. Uh, the president himself has even said it's basically a peacekeeping operation, and he's right. You know, everybody that you know loses their life or is injured still in Afghanistan, we all know that's a tragedy. But if you compare that to active combat operations we've had in Afghanistan in the past, it's very minimal. Our investment is very minimal, and what we're doing is providing a stabilizing training force to the Afghan government. Now, look, everywhere we've ever been engaged militarily, we still have a residual pre presence around the world. All you have to do is you know, look at a history of our conflicts and you know, see that there's military still there. Um, and that will probably be the situation in Afghanistan. But I think to come to the table, and, and one of the mistakes I think the president has made was just being very open about wanting to get out because it's tough to go into a negotiation from a position of strength when you've already shown your cards and your end desire, which is to leave. So the Taliban knows that they can resist. They can get some concessions out of uh, this whole thing. And if anybody believes that the Taliban really does want peace and just wants to be involved in a democratic process in Afghanistan, uh, I think we'll see quickly that that's incorrect. I think the counterpoint to that would be, and I generally agree with you, but Trump campaigned on this, right? And he won the election, and it's something that is not just pretty popular among many Republicans. It's broadly popular among independents. And in fact, many Democrats will sort of grit their teeth and say, well, yeah, he's, he's right on this one. So politically, there is a strong appetite for a closure moment in Afghanistan for the United States. And the Taliban, it's not like their leadership is stupid. They know that. They know the pressures. They can log on to YouTube and watch speeches where Trump promised this. So I understand the point about putting maybe too many cards on the table in terms of concessions. And I think we'd be very critical if it had been Barack Obama. Uh, in fact, we were very critical of Barack Obama yeah. on exactly these types of fronts during his presidency. But I sort of get the sense that President Trump is saying, yeah, I, I get it. All the smart people say that there are all these risks and we might have to go back and we're just a peacekeeping force. But we've been a quote unquote stabilizing force for long enough. It's time for these people to either sink or swim on their own. And anyone on our side who gets killed over there, it's it's not OK anymore. It is completely unacceptable. Yeah. It's avoidable at this point. Again, all of the caution, cautionary words and points that you're making, I happen to agree with. I'm just articulating what I think is a very strong sentiment held by a lot of people. Yeah, and I think it's a legitimate sentiment. But, you know, here's here's the reality of this. We live in a new world. We we like to look back at history books and see, you know, Germany and Vietnam and all these things as our kind of guide for the future. And there's nothing wrong with using that as lessons. But that was before the world of jihadist terrorists existed. That was before the world of the Internet where people can recruit people and – you know, giving a moral victory to the Taliban and thereby, frankly, a moral victory to ISIS and any other extremist, you know, the United States is once again defeated, will be a potent recruitment tool for jihadists uh, on the Internet, it, here at home, in other countries. And secondly, on the popularity and the promise issue, first off, yeah, it's, it's not a popular war, but what you don't see is what you saw in Vietnam. People aren't on the streets protesting. There's not a draft. There's not, you know, a thousand people dying a month. Um, and so there really isn't – while people, if you ask them, do you want to get out of Afghanistan, most people would say yes. It's not a driving issue for them because it's just not like Vietnam, you know. And an answer of yes versus, uh, you know, do we haven't had anybody really articulate the reason to be there in a while. I don't blame them for feeling that way. But on the, on the campaign promise side of things, I think the president has followed through on the vast majority of his campaign promises – and it's the ones that I think really sold people, which is the idea of, you know, the blue collar getting back to work and, and, and wage growth and economic freedom. Those are the ones. I don't think a lot of people voted for President Trump based solely on the issue of Afghanistan. So, yes, it's a campaign promise he made. It was one I disagreed with when he was making it. But I don't know if that was the driving factor. So It's again, probably not, driving for some people, but I think your your broader point is well taken, as is your point about – previous wars versus today's more asymmetrical threats. And I think if you also pose the question to the American people, do you want to get out of, 
get out of Afghanistan now? The answer would be yes. What if X, Y, and Z were to occur because of that withdrawal? Right. Then people start to say, well, hang on. What does that mean in the future? Can we avoid more problems down the line if we just keep this light footprint now? It does get a bit more nuanced than a dichotomous single well, you know, poll question. And think about this quickly. If when, when you would ask people, do you want to leave Iraq? People would have said yes, and President Obama pulled us out of Iraq. Then if you just said, do you want to go back into Iraq to fix the ISIS problem? The vast majority of Americans said yes. So Americans follow the leadership and the articulation that leadership places to them. Right. And sometimes binary poll questions aren't necessarily entirely what they may seem. I want to pick up on a point that you were just making involving the economy and some of those promises kept from President Trump. We saw a fantastic, a surprisingly to the experts, fantastic jobs report in February. Things really going quite well. However, coronavirus seems to be not only a threat to a lot of more elderly people and infirm people, people with other conditions in terms of their health. There's also, I think, a real threat to the economy as well. If large or even, let's say, significant swaths of the economy get shut down or hampered or kind of handcuffed because of coronavirus, how are you thinking about this threat in terms of public health and also in terms of economic health? I think it's pretty serious. You know, the economy, all that is, is uh, we just measure human interactions. That's really all an economy is. And right now, human interactions are uh, on a down, you know, there's there's areas that we can't get supply from. We do not know until the smoke clears what the damage to China was. I think in the long term, it'll be rebalancing uh, the U.S. and China's position, which may not be a terrible thing. Um, but this is going to have an economic impact. And the other thing on the health side, you know, it's weird because somehow this has even become partisan because everything is nowadays. And you have some people saying this isn't an issue at all. It's all made up by the left. And some on the left saying, you know, this is the end of the world and the end of humanity and Donald Trump. Right, and Trump did it. Yeah, and Trump did it all. The reality is it is somewhere in the middle. This is a new strain of virus that we don't have antibodies in our body for. Unlike the flu, you know, we have some defenses against it. And, uh, and this is going to affect particularly seniors and particularly seniors with pre-existing conditions. What I think the government needs to do is really focus on getting the testing kits out, getting a real grip on how much of this virus is in the United States, and then focusing as hard as we can on the vaccine. And I think that will calm the markets and calm a lot of people's fears. Right now, I think it's the fear of the unknown uh, that's really making a lot of people uncomfortable. And D.C., frankly, right now is almost – Ground zero for this is where, you know, we have people from all over the, the country that come in and visit. What do you think of the idea to have some people are calling them bailouts, economic support for certain industries or workers who might miss work because they have to in quarantines and that sort of thing? Is there a role there for the federal government? I think to an extent, uh, not like a Bernie Sanders role where, the you know, the job of the government is to defend against everything uncomfortable. That's not. Our job is let's do what we can to find a vaccine. Let's make sure that the economy still functions. And so to the extent that we can be helpful in that, yes. Keeping in mind, though, we've made decisions for 40 years out here that have led to a $21 trillion debt. And if we you know, had much less than that, we'd have a lot more bullets in our gun to be able to use. But right now we've created, because we don't want to talk about having to reform Social Security, we don't want to talk about Medicare, we don't yep. want to talk about these tough things, and yep. so now we don't have a lot of options. And that's going to be the issue. We have to reform these entitlement systems for people, frankly, your age and my age, and uh, we're too scared to do it, and writing a check isn't the answer. So there, there needs to be some level of something. It might be a good time for an infrastructure bill. Um, but at the end of the day, the idea of preventing everybody from discomfort is just not a role of the federal government. Last question, briefly, Congressman. Tucker Carlson had a monologue on Fox News Monday night on his program, Tucker Carlson Tonight, where one of the points he made was it's disturbing how much we rely on China for some of our drugs and for key supply chains when it comes to things like surgical masks and other supplies that would be absolutely essential in a circumstance exactly like this one. And he said, considering that they're an adversary, to have that much reliance on any other country, let alone a potential enemy, is disturbing to him. Do you agree? Yes. And, you know, the Republicans in Congress and the president – we started to fix this with supply chain vulnerabilities, with pandemic preparation, which was a uniquely Republican thing that we created. 
but we did it too late. And, you know, this should have been done 10 or 15, 20 years ago. The president was right in the trade war in China. And I think in the future, we need to take that into account uh, to defend our country because we've seen the vulnerabilities and hopefully it's not as bad as it could be. And uh, it's a it's a stern lesson for us. Illinois Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger, a newlywed. Congratulations again and thanks for coming on. You bet, brother. Take care. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. It's the happy hour on The Guy Benson Show.